NAND flash chips. A little different than standard flash chips. Can be a little more problematic. So we're going to talk about that and uh, kind of step through with uh, a number of demos. So great. Let's go ahead and get started. So the, thanks to everyone uh, this evening or this afternoon, based on where you're at in the United States. Um, Presentations NAND chips, introduction to NAND chip extraction and data reconstruction. This is an intro, intro primer. Um, we're going to cover a, a number of different topics, and we have like three different demos. Uh, I think you'll get a lot out of this. So my name is Daryl Hyland. I'm the principal security researcher for IoT at Rapid7. So the section one, we're going to just give a, a basic introduction uh, and look at structure. So what is a NAND, flip, uh, a NAND flash memory? Simple, you can read it. It's non-volatile storage technology that doesn't require power to retain the data. Pretty straightforward. See those references there? If you're interested in learning more in the nitty gritty, take a screenshot of that real quick uh, because that is great references. Uh, I go back to these quite regularly to kind of refresh myself because some of the stuff can get pretty deep uh, as you're trying to uh, reconstruct data in a number of cases. So go ahead and get a screenshot of that. I'm getting ready to jump off of it now. So a uh, couple things. When we start thinking about NAND, um, NAND flash memory chips, uh, you need to go to the data sheet. You really need to understand how things are laid out. This will play a part in recovery a number of times. So this is the memory array structure that lays out the page, uh, the blocks, and the planes. In this case, uh, the page is uh, 2K in size or 2048 bytes. And then there's what's referred to as an OOB area, a 64-byte area at the end. Uh, and this is critical. So what is OB? It's out of band. It's a spare area. It's used for containing error correction code information, uh, bad block information, and it exists in every page. So what does that mean? Generally, what it means is you have all your data uh, jammed full of uh, potential garbage when you're trying to parse it out and rebuild the data. And this could be impactful and can cause problems in some cases. So we're going to talk about how we're going to fix that. And we're going to show that in a couple examples. The OOB area, the out of band area, is also laid out in two formats. One is known as uh, adjacent and one is known as separate. If it's laid out, the OOB is laid out adjacent. So a 2048 byte page would be laid out with a 16K or 16 byte uh, of OOB after every 512 bytes. This would be an adjacent layout. Uh, the most common I see is what's known as separate. Uh, separate area is the 64 bytes of data exists at the end of the 2048 byte page. This is the most common, but often you need to uh, verify that uh, as you're working through this and trying to remove the data or correct the problem. Another thing that comes in handy, and this is in reference to a number of the tools uh, that we're going to use today, your chip ID code. Uh, an example, anytime you use a, a flash memory reader, so you pull a chip out, drop it into a memory chip reader, often it will, when you set it up for that chip, it associates that with a ID, and it'll read the chip compare the ID on the chip to make sure it matches before it tries to read the data. Now, a lot of applications out there have a use for this type of chip ID data. This is out of the data sheet also. And in this example here, it's showing the data sheet for a S34 MSO2G1 chip, which is a 512 megabyte NAND flash. Uh, and you can see at the bottom, it shows what that chip ID is for that chip. And you'll see that we'll use this later on, and we'll probably come back and look at it in the data sheet again when we get ready to do that. So at this point, are there any questions? So Jonathan, has anyone posted any questions or anyone not have any questions about some of these basic concepts? Let's see here. Uh, so far, it looks like no questions posted here. 
Um, one quick question that is uh, actually coming up here that I'm seeing. Um, whenever you're, I guess, pulling um, firmware firmware from uh, NAND flash, do you have like a consistent philosophy that you follow, such as like always first see if you can, you know, first pull maybe if you can like uh, log into it via like, like serial port through UART? Or do you typically go straight for attempting to dump the NAND flash contents? Yeah, usually the first way, if I want to get the data, uh, the most the most effective way is get the data when it's in a constructed fashion. That would mean if I can get a console on the device with the entire operating system running and the entire uh, partitions for all the data laid out, that's easier because then I could easily DD the partitions off the off the chip in their constructed fashion. And that would avoid me almost always having to do what we're gonna talk about here. What we're gonna talk about here is in that case where you actually have to read the data raw right off the flash chip, either uh, chip off where you remove the chip and drop it into a reader or some other uh, methods where you may be able to clip on or hook onto the device and read the raw uh, data out of the chip. Um, and that's when you get this structure that we're going to be dealing with today and how to clean it up and a few methods of recovering that. So I, I, I shout out to everyone. Um, if you're interested in interacting or asking questions during this, join the, um, the, the Zoom chat, uh, the Zoom channel that we have set up for the webcast. Uh, once you're into there, you'll be able to post questions up. Uh, during the presentation, and hopefully we'll have time and we'll be able to answer them. So uh, please do that if you can. It makes this way much more interactive. Instead of just being a data dump, we have a chance to actually interact with the audience and the people uh, and learn more in this process. So I'll go ahead and move on. So section two is uh, a general chip readers. Since I talked about chip off uh, from the question Jonathan um, gave us, we get into chip readers. So when you're interacting with a NAND flash chip, here are the signals you're typically going to need to interact with. And they go everything from uh, the 8-bit uh, data channel, the bidirectional channel, all the way down to input signal, output signal structure, and some other various pieces. Uh, so if you end up buying off the shelf uh, chip reader, this kind of solves all these problems. But there was some work done out there uh, by this gentleman here. I would recommend taking a look at this write up. Uh, if you're interested in building your own chip reader, this one actually works against a TSOP 48 uh, NAND flash chip. And he uses a technique known as bit banging uh, using this uh, FTDI uh, board that he has here. Uh, he's able to bit bang the data off of the actual chip. So um, I would look at looking at what bit banging is, because uh, I'm not going to explain it here, uh, and uh, look at how he set this thing up. If you're uh, the hacker mentality and you like the idea of building things your own, I would check this out. It's kind of cool. If you're like me and you just like to throw money at it, um, these are chip readers are reasonably inexpensive. Uh, the TI-866 Plus, you get all the sockets with it. It's like 130 bucks. This will read a number of NAND chips. Pretty good. And it uses a TSOP 48. Uh, right below it is a socket that doesn't come with the set that you need to buy. This socket is for uh, from TSOP 32s to 48s. It's known as a NAND 08. This is for larger memory chips. So anytime you encounter larger uh, NAND flash memory chips in the TSOP 48, the one that comes with the kit will not work and only work with smaller memory blocks. Uh, so you need to get the socket for that. The ProMan isn't made, this model isn't made anymore, but they do make a, um, uh, a similar version. Uh, so if you search for ProMan, you'll find a similar version out there. Uh, the socket below that is, um, designed for 1.8 volts. Uh, the ProMan is typically a 3.3 volt device, uh, and we're starting to see way more chips in the 1.8 volt uh, arena. So it's good to have that add-on. Most of these add-ons are eight, nine, ten dollars on both of these chip readers, so they're fairly inexpensive. Uh, the thing I like about the ProMan is if I can't identify a TSOP 48, I can't find the data sheets, 
uh, or not, well, let's say I do have the data sheets and I can't find any information uh, on none of my chip readers. They don't identify it, they can't detect it. This will let you hard set page OB block sizes into the actual uh, tool that comes with the application that comes with this so that you can attempt to read it using that kind of raw information. Uh, and it's been successful several times uh, with me, making it possible for me to read a NAND flash chip where I had the data sheet to identify that structure, but none of my chip readers would recognize the chip. Uh, and the last one's uh, uh, RT-809, uh, and that one's a little more pricey if you buy it off Amazon, but I think you can uh, track that one down on AliExpress cheaper. Uh, I like this one. It, it's, it's not a bad chip reader, and it has, uh, you can buy a lot of different sockets for it. Um, most of the sockets that come where the TL866 Plus, the one on the left, will work on this, all but the TSOP48 sockets because the TSOP48 sockets have a circuitry built into them, so they won't work on this reader. You have to have a straight pin through. Um, and the one I have below shows that uh, TSOP48 socket that's a straight pin through. Uh, I also recently had to pull a NAND flash that was a BGA ball girder array, 63 uh, ball balls on the bottom of it. Uh, and I was able to buy this off uh, AliExpress for the 80. Uh, RT-809 for about 40 bucks, which isn't bad. Uh, if you get into the high-end chip readers that run, uh, start off at like $1,600, $1,700 and go up for them, the sockets for them start off at $100, $200 and go up into the thousands for BGA sockets. Uh, so these things are very cost effective. Uh, the sockets are not high quality, so you have to take care of them. But they're overall, they're pretty good products, uh, and I use them quite regularly uh, in my lab without issues uh, working with uh, NAND chips. So uh, any questions um, in reference to the um, chip readers and chip reading process? One question here. Um, what are the most challenging NAND packages or pitches to work with that you've encountered? Is there any package or pitch you you would not attempt messing with? I would never say there's nothing I wouldn't attempt messing with. Um, I would literally mess with everything. Um, probably some of the biggest problem is, obviously, if you're using a chip reader to try to read this, uh, the BGAs or uh, ball grid array devices are the more problematic uh, because there may not be a socket available for some of these devices. Uh, in cases in cases like that, um, if you have the data sheets, you can always go to the process of dead bugging. That is turning the ball grid array chip on its backside and soldering small 40 gauge wire to um, the actual balls and then feed that into uh, a connector or a chip reader or uh, a device for doing uh, bit banging. Um, to actually be able to do that. And I have been successful doing that a couple times, uh, but it's a pain in the butt. It's way much easier to pull the chip with hot air or IR if it's a BGA, clean it up, drop it in some device, close the lid and have it give you all the data. Uh, but uh, typically uh, if I need the data off of it and I can't get it any other way other than chip off, uh, I will chip off um, from the board and if necessarily, I will dead bug one. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, me and you, Jonathan, we, we worked together at one time where we dead bugged that, uh, that one weird device. Uh, we had a 0.25 millimeter uh, pitch uh, BGA, and we had to solder 40 wires to it, or 20 wires to it, uh, to get it to uh to get it hooked up. So yeah, we're going to try anything. I'm not going to pass up uh, any potential target if it has data on it that I want. Makes sense. But, and you're definitely bringing back some uh, crazy memories with that. And actually you, you partially answered the next question as well. Um, the next question was what hot air tools do you recommend for BGA removal? Uh, actually um, I have both hot air and I have a uh, IR oven. Uh, I like the IR oven. 
once I got it, it's a small, it's a small device. It'll take a board that's probably uh, eight by nine, eight by 10 inches or something like that. To me, that's the sweetest thing in the world. Um, I usually just stick it in the oven, run it through the cycle that I brings it up to the temperature and I take a suction tool, I pull the chip off of it and then I let the whole board cool down. Uh, because, uh, you know, it heats up the whole board. You have to watch out for things like plastic components that are on the board. So you may have to remove those prior to putting them in the oven. But uh, you can usually pick up one of these IR ovens. If I remember, what was the name of the one I got? Uh, it's spelled P-U-H-U-I. Um, it's a Chinese-made product or Asian-made product uh, oven that I have. I think it's a Model 2962 uh, is what it is. Um, small oven. I think I only paid like $130, $140 for it, somewhere around there. Uh, and there's a number of products out there like that. But and infrared is way much better, in my opinion, than hot air. So. Another question. Sorry, Daryl. Is it it's come, uh, Elvis Cousin asks, is it hard to reball BGA without killing it to resolder? Uh, yes, it's uh, it's. It's it's not it's not that hard. Uh, it's just the process of learning how to do it. Um, not to drag this all out, but I had I had a project where I wanted to learn how to do this uh, because I wanted to get root access on a device. It had a 153 ball BGA embedded multimedia controller on the device, so I used the hot air. I pulled it off. Um, and I had a couple of devices because I wanted to, in case I killed one of them. The first one, when I put the balls back on, there's a couple ways of doing it. You can use um, screens with paste or you can use just the balls. Uh, in my case, I just used the balls. Uh, I floated on there correctly, but I overheated the chip and it looked like a chocolate brownie when I was done. Uh, that's when I learned that you don't want to go uh, on these um, BGA chips. You don't want to go over about 210. Uh, well, Melting temperature is about 183 degrees Celsius, if I remember right. Uh, and you don't want to go over more, more than 2.5, uh, 2.7 on the temperature in Celsius. If you hit 2.15 or higher, it starts causing the uh, fiberglass substrate of the chips to start breaking down. Uh, but if you keep it within those range and you don't shock it by overheating it too quick or cooling it too fast, uh, it'll work. And I was successful. Uh, the first one I burn up and I failed. The second one was perfect. Uh, since then, I've never had a problem ever uh, working with uh, BGAs, either pulling them uh, or putting them back on uh, without damage. And once I learned those uh, temperature parameters. Okay, so the next section we want to move into uh, is going to be demo. So we're going to get off into uh, the demo area and see how that works out. Uh, hopefully we won't have any technical problems. So what we're going to do here is we have a flash memory that's been pulled. This has been pulled from, let's go ahead and look at it. I got a couple of them here. It's pulled from an Arlo device. Uh, which is a doorbell, if I remember rightly. It's actually uh, uh, kind of like a ring doorbell type product. Its memory chip was a W25N01GV. So typically when you pull this thing, what's the first thing you want to do is Benwalk. And again, Benwalk works many times, but sometimes it does not. So we'll give this a try uh, and see what happens here. Hopefully we won't run into any real technical problems. And this is kind of the common flow. Uh, we see we hit a, a squash file system. Uh, we should have at least two squash file systems on there if it's coming off a standard embedded device. And there's a second one. Uh, and then it kind of hangs right there. Um, if we set here, this thing would set here in idle for uh, hours and not produce anything. So we're going to stop that. So if we change over to the extraction from Benwalk, uh, we can see that it opened up a bunch of stuff, but then there's a squash file system. So as we notice, there's nothing in there. And truthfully, because it went past the squash file system file, it should have put something in there. 
So as we can see, there's literally nothing in there. So uh, for the most part, uh, this didn't work. Um, this is a uh, actually a fresh rebuild of uh, Benwalk. And uh, also I have a Benwalk uh, Pro uh, account. Uh, the results are pretty much the same in this particular case because there's some things that have to be dealt with here. So let's go ahead and remove um, this structure just so I don't start running into space issues by blowing all this stuff out of here. So what do we want to do? Uh, well, as we talked earlier, we talked about the actual OOB area. So we want to be able to remove uh, that area. So we have a tool on here uh, called uh, NAND dump. And at the end of this presentation, I'm going to have links uh, for everything, which will cover all this stuff. So here we can actually do input files, output files. Remember that ID I mentioned to you, chip ID? We can use chip ID, or we can specify actual page size, OBs, and the layout. Remember, adjacent, separate. So in this particular case, we are going to, um, well, before we go ahead and separate the um, OOB out of here, let's go ahead and look at the data sheet. So as we look at the data sheet, we see that it is 2048 bytes by 64. So it is in a separate format. That means the 64 bytes at, as at the end of the page. That's a good sign. That tells us the structure. You always want to go to the data sheet. But typically, I always like to dig a little deeper and make sure that the chip hasn't been kind of messed with. Um, and why I say that, because just because the data sheet says this is how the chip's going to be laid out, the manufacturer that actually used the chip, I've seen them do some strange things, to say the least, to the data, meaning that, you know, you go and remove the OOB area thinking you know where it's at uh, and literally have it not be laid out the same way. So we're going to look at this uh, with hex edits. So we're going to look at the raw data of the actual device so we can see what it looks like. Uh. There we go. So uh, at this point, we should be able to go to uh, 2048, which would be 800 in hex. Uh, and it should be the beginning uh, of the second block. So we can see that there's something here. Uh, it looks a little different, but it may not be. We're not quite sure. Um, it doesn't really tell us a lot. So we could go to the next block. So, it, for example, if it's uh, hex is uh, 800, uh, and we want to, uh, of course, we want to go, remember, is 20. Gosh, we get it right here. So if we go 2048, we'll get it cleared here in a second. Try it again. 2048, um, which would be 800. And we want to go uh, up to the next beginning, which should be 2,112 bytes. Remember, 2048 plus the 64. And we look at this, it should be at 1040. So if we go to 1040, We still see some interesting things, and this may tell us that this is correct, but I've seen a lot of devices where uh, the actual OOB area was nothing but all Fs and wasn't actually configured. So what we're going to do is let's look a little deeper so we can see some patterns, because I'm always a big fan of spotting patterns. So we come over here and oh, get it going. And we're going to search for strings so we can get some data. So here we are. So we're in an area where there's a lot of strings. And let's scroll down until we see some patterns. Uh, and quickly, we see a pattern right here. So got a pattern right there. So if that is, so we go, hold up, 2112. 
and go. So it'd be 840. So we go 840 plus E880. E880 equals F0, C0. So the next pattern should be an F0, C0. And we can see that we're starting to see that pattern there also. So as we can see, more than likely, we are uh, witnessing the 64 bytes at the end of the 2048 as the OB area is showing up. And again, if we look over in the string area, there's uh, no common words because I would not expect that to be in the area. So let's scroll on down to the next one. There's another thing I like to do sometimes, uh, especially if I'm having problems uh, positively identifying this location. So this one will involve a little bit of math. So I like to use a calculator for that. So if we come over here and we put this in here like that and we turn it to decimal and then uh, because the programming calculator does not round off or have decimal points, we want to do this basic. So what do we know about the overall structure? The first OOB area or uh, OOB area showed up after 2048. So we had the first 2048s, and then to get to the next leading ones, we had 2112. So we go ahead and subtract, and hopefully my math works here and doesn't mess it up, 2048, uh, and then uh, divide it by 2112, and hopefully we'll get an even number, and we did. If you do not get an even number, then this is not mathematically correct for an OOB area. So what we're seeing here is 0500F900 is actually the 39,749th page of data in this particular device. Okay. So now that I've punished you with some math, we're going to go ahead and it strip that out of it. So we have this command called NAN uh, dump PI. We're gonna use dot I Arlo for the input, the layout separate. Page size happens to be 2048, the OOB size is 64. And then the output will be Arlo no OOB. Hopefully this runs and it finished up. So there, once we finished up, we have a file that's a little smaller, as you can see, where the OOB has been stripped out of it. And let's go ahead and run this and see if this works for us. The first squash system, you see the pattern's different now. Uh, and then we also see that there's an UBI uh, structure also starting to show up. Uh, often you'll see uh, inside an operating system on an embedded device, you'll see squash file systems, which are uh, typically read only. Uh, UBI, UBI file systems uh, allow read and write. So it may be an area that's used dynamically that's being created uh, that can use to read and write data into uh, the device. Okay, so that one actually finished. So let's go ahead and jump over here and see if it worked for us. Uh, a little different there. We see we got three folders. We have UBI root system. Um, so we go to squash root. And there you go. We were actually able to extract this data by effectively removing the out of band data within the NAND flash dump. So do we have any questions? Yeah, we got a couple of questions here, T Dup. So, um, Elvis Cousin asks, I have two BGAs on a daughter board. Is it likely I can read each individually or will I need to reassemble them somehow to try to get a squash FS? And they're also both uh, Intel based flash. Oh, you're saying you have two uh, flash memory chips on the device. Um, really comes down to how they, how they lay those out. Um, I would not expect, them to stripe across separate chips like that. I've never seen that. 
Often when I've seen two chips done up like that, each one will contain a different partition uh, or they may be redundant of each other. Um, but typically they'll be partitioned to get, uh, separately on embedded. That's the way I've seen it. Um, and I've seen everything from uh, where one chip actually contain um, the, the boot, the U-boot and the kernel and the other one contained the file system. Uh, as an example. So the only way is to pull them off, examine the data and make a determination from there uh, to see if you can do it. Uh, of course, the best solution is, is if you can get a root console on the device somehow, then obviously you could figure that out more quickly and DD the partitions off that way, which is also the, the, the sweetest way of doing it. Um, but if you have to chip off, um, yeah, you still may have to do some analysis of them. You, uh, yeah, you kind of... Uh... Uh, pivoted off that said both are connected to a common connector, but I don't have a pinout to try to recover cross connector by soldering something. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of hard to say. Um, if you have some kind of pictures or images of the data and the chip, or not the data, the chips and the layout and the board, uh, shoot them to me sometime, and and maybe I can uh, take a look at it and uh, come up with a help you come up with a plan of attack. Um, like I said, anyone's feel free to reach out to me anytime. I may or may not have a, an answer for you, but I'd be more than glad to give you a hand if I can. One final quick question here that I'm seeing. Um, so in this particular case, it looks like you're able to find the data sheet. Have you ever encountered a NAND chip that you wanted to dump but couldn't identify it or could not locate a data sheet for? If so, how did you approach that? Uh, yes, uh, guessing. <laughs> Often, often, if if uh, if I can't find a data sheet actually for that, I've actually gone out and looked at other chips uh, that may have data sheets that are in that same series or produced by that manufacturer, and figure out how they uh, do their layout. Um, even though I may not be able to uh, quickly identify the chip ID, uh, there are ways to actually enumerate those and. It, usually typically need a data sheet to do that. Uh, but uh, guessing uh, does work and uh, crazy as can be, I've actually dumped uh, a lot of chips by going, hey, here's a manufacturer. And it seems like most of their chips or a large portion of them uh, within this structure range are laid out this way. They have this page structure, this size, uh, often the naming conventions, uh, like like here on the screen, W25N01GV. Uh, that's one gigabit chip. Uh, and often in the name, you can figure out what the size of the chip is a lot of times. So that, that would be uh, 100, well, 8 bits, what, 128 uh, K bytes or whatever. Um, so it's doable just looking at the name sometimes to pull some typical information out of it and then guessing on some of the other stuff. But again, I've also like smoke chips um, by doing weird things to them. It obviously didn't work. So got to take some caution and take some risk. Um, but uh, amazing enough, it can be successful. Uh, one of the things to do also is kind of look at if you can get a UART console onto the main processor. Let's say the main processor has a console. Even though you can't get root access to it, capture all the debug data from the boot up. Um, that can also be very revealing sometimes. Okay, time to move on. So uh, we've kind of done that. Uh, we're able to get the data off that. I'm going to go ahead and clean this up because we have a couple exercises to go to and I don't want to run out of time. So Okay, so the next one we want to look at, uh, I'm also going to RM the Arlo. No. So the next one we want to look at is the nest. Uh, this actually came from a friend of mine who had his nest thermostat crash out. It just died. Uh, he threw it my way, said, hey, can you get any interesting data off of it? So, uh, And I struggled with getting data off of this, but it was eventually successful. We're, we're going to show uh, some of this. Uh, there was no, and, and um, 
confidential data actually extracted from the device. So there's no problem with it, us using it here. But uh, so what we want to do is what we're going to use is uh, a process where we're going to create a NAND sim. Uh, so what does that mean? We're actually going to simulate a NAND chip in memory. Uh, we're going to use uh, like Mod Probe. Uh, if you haven't used Mod Probe, Mod Probe will let you uh, load kernel modules onto the system. So we're going to build a block device using um, Mod Probe um, kernel modules. We're going to load those up, and then we're going to write the data out to the chip. Uh, we're actually going to tell the data with NanWrite to use the OOB data to reconstruct any error corrections and that type of stuff. Uh, and then we'll mount it up. So uh, this particular one, I actually ran uh, Benwalk on this um, and it never recovered anything. Uh, I actually shot it out to uh, good friends at, uh, um, at, um, that do the Benwalk Pro. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I didn't get back to the system for a couple of weeks and it churned out there. So I apologize on, to them again for eating up several terabyte of data. So this thing was constructually uh, a pain in the butt um, and running Benwalk was uh, potentially catastrophic. Uh, it would eat up all your memory and produce nothing. Um, and I'm not going to run it here, uh, but if you run it, every page uh, or every header for a GIFs to file system or every header for one of those, it would create a folder for it, put nothing in it, um, and literally eat up terabytes of data in a couple of days quickly. So let's go ahead and get uh, get going here. So we're going to load Mod Probe uh, MTD, Mod Probe Block. This will help us set up a block device, um, and then we're going to go ahead and. We're going to load this up here. So the way this works, Mod Probe NAND Sim, BCH is uh, error correction functionality. Uh, this was uh, the chip. It uses a 8-bit structure. Uh, there's a BCH16 for a 16-bit structure, if that's actually being used. Uh, and this here happens to be the chip ID. So if we go over to this particular chip, that is not the one I want. So this is the actual chip, and I believe we go to page 25, if I have this memorized. Okay. And this would be the read ID, the ID of the actual chip. We know this chip is a 2-gig chip. It's organized in 8-bit structure. It is a 1.8-volt bit chip. So 0, 1 is the first one, AA9015. 4.4 isn't used in this case, but it deals with error corrections and multi-plane information. Um, multi-plane information, just to make note here, if you have a chip that has multi-planes on it, um, and you'll see it in the data sheet, it may or may not stripe across the two planes, meaning it puts one block on one plane and one block on the next plane versus putting them contiguously on the same plane. I have not encountered this, uh, but I have read about it. So it's something to be noted. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and load this up. So now, now we've loaded up um, that particular module, uh, kernel module. And now let's go ahead and just look at some information, MTD info. And this will tell us a little bit about what we just created. So we created a simulated, it's how many bytes? 256 megabyte chip, 2048, sub page size, 64 bytes, um, pretty straightforward. And then we go ahead and this one may show some errors Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and we're going to look at this um, within a D message. And if we come down here, we can see that it took the manufacturer ID, chip ID, and information, and actually have identified the actual chip. That is the chip ID that does that and helps lay this out. So the next thing is we want to be able to write into it. 
So we're going to use um, Nanwrite, which is uh, another tool. Hope you don't mind me not typing. It saves you guys a lot of headaches. So um, let's cancel out of that. Nanwrite. I want to see the command. So here's all the functions. So what we're going to do is we're going to input contains OOB data. So we're telling it to uh, utilize the OOB data. And we're going to go ahead and let this run. And hopefully it'll run through clean. Boom. There we wrote all of the blocks out uh, on the device. So the next step is, uh, we'll come over here so you see this. We go LS. Um, And we can see there's nothing there. Uh, and then what we're going to do is cut and paste. So I don't have to type. We're going to mount this up on block zero. Boom. Change directory to GIFs. And voila, we have data. So uh, if we look through here, it starts looking pretty good. Hey, we've recovered all this data. Uh, the sad thing is uh, most of this stuff is system logs um, that we recovered. But if we get up here toward the top, we find some weird things. Uh, here's bin. It's a file. ETC is a file. Well, truthfully, this is bull crap. <laughs> We know that's not a file. So if we cat ETC, wow, look what we get. Uh, now, nah, I wouldn't expect to see that in ETC. So we recovered a lot of it, but some of it's corrupted in a weird fashion. Um, so how did I recover from this? I experimented, uh, and we're going to go over that in a minute. But before we go forward, I actually want to uh, see if there are any questions. Jonathan, any questions yeah. out there? Yep, taking a look now. Um, no updates here. Um, checking Twitch real quick. Um, uh, yes, here's here's a question. In IoT devices you've examined, do you ever come across NAN storing non-file system data? If so, do you just dump and then use Binwalk and other usual tools and methods for poking around? Yeah, I've had them uh, storing non-file system data uh, on uh, NAN flash. Uh, so, uh, yeah, typically, typically I get into that and I, I, uh, when I get those and there's no structure to them, I start off with, uh, throwing things like, uh, strings to the thing, uh, with strings, can we, uh, identify, uh, any known structure, uh, in there. Um, I will run Benwalk just to see what it'll do. Sometimes it'll point out some structure headers, uh, that I can more quickly find. So I think that plays a big role. Uh, but yeah, uh, sometimes you'll have them find uh, storing things like uh, blocks of configuration data. Um, and I've seen them uh, just blocks of encrypted data, which may be a file system structure, but they're not in, uh, they're not framed as such. So it's just uh, encrypted blocks of useless information. Uh, so yeah, that's not all that in common. Well, most of the time when I get a NAND chip, it's a file system, but you will encounter those, uh, to be honest. So right now, before we move on to the next section, I want to uh, remove the um, kernel modules so they don't conflict with what we're doing. Okay, and we are down to... Uh, we still got some time, doing pretty good. So the next section I want to get into, we are going to use um, MTD RAM uh, to actually do this. So we're going to take that same system, that same uh, same dump uh, that we just did, uh, where we mounted up the file system, it did not come out exactly the way we want it. And we're going to mess with that. So we're going to make a make directory, and we're actually going to create our own block structure.
Um, and then we'll go, and then we're going to make a node. If I learn how to spell it, I should just copy this over. Make node uh, dev slash MTD block. Uh, and we're going to create zero. We're going to create it as a block device. Uh, we're going to give it a, a master number, a primary number, and um, a minor number of zero. So we're going to create that device in there. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to use mod probe. And we're going to bring in a kernel module called MTD RAM. So this kernel module's MTD RAM. We're setting the total size to 274432. That is bigger than a 256 megabyte RAM area. Uh, 256 megabyte RAM area would be 262144, and that would not contain OOB data. In this case here, we're bringing in the OOB data also. Um, because if I bring in without the OOB data, I noticed uh, that we get the same results as the other ones. So experimenting, and I encourage you to experiment when you're dealing with these NAND chips. Um, it can be quite fascinating what you can uh, find and figure out and make work to get you data out of this system. I'm currently working on one. It has me slightly befuddled, but I will master it eventually uh, where the actual entire data on the chip is shifted 10 bytes. Uh, they even shifted all the OOB data 10 bytes. Uh, and it took uh, looking at it <laughs> manually to figure this all out and doing that math and looking at the data in the uh, uh, structure to determine that they had also shifted that because I was getting block errors saying that block is 10 bytes longer than it's supposed to be type thing. That's when we found out that everything was shifted and was able to confirm that the OOB was shifted too. But I digress. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to load this up. And it's supposed to contain the entire thing. And then we want to load one more module. MTD block for a kernel module. Uh, and then we're going to uh, DD. Uh, excuse me. Come over here. And DD's a bit copy. Uh, I use this all the time. Matter of fact, if you get access to almost every embedded IoT device, you'll find DD's actually installed on it. Because uh, most of the time, DD's actually used for uh, doing firmware upgrades. Uh, you'll have duplicate uh, root file structures, duplicate kernels uh, on the device. And what happens is one is primary and running. Uh, so what will happen is when the firmware comes down, it'll DD it over the secondary, and then it'll change the U-boot or secure boot arguments to make the new one primary and the old one secondary. That way, if you uh, have a failed firmware update, it does not brick the device. It just goes back to uh, the original one, which was not overridden. So uh, again, input file. Um, here is the nest file, and then output is to our block device that we created. And if I did everything right, uh, this should start writing data. Should be fairly quick, and as you see, we we're able to write out uh, 277 uh, megabytes of information fairly quick because it's all internal to the system. So from here, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, mount this up. Uh, same way we did on the other one, um, and we're going to mount MTD block zero up. Now, if someone wants to explain to me why this worked, because I uh, really not sure why, uh, like I said, uh, often dealing with NAND chips, uh, little quirky things have worked for me, so I'm not going to speak bad of them. Uh, now we can see ED, uh, ETC and bin are actual files. We do have some corruptions in here, so there's a few files actually corrupted um, within this. But for the most part, a large portion of them uh, were actually able to be recovered properly. And um, so these are methods that I use quite regularly uh, for recovering. Um, 
when you start uh, working with Ubi file systems, uh, if I ever get uh, some good um, methods, methodologies hammered out for working with some of the strange UBI file systems, like the one with the 10 bytes that shifted. Uh, I did one on an engagement here uh, earlier this year, where again, uh, nothing, our large portions of it were not laid out contiguously uh, and trying to build uh, good solid methodologies around UBI. I'll probably come back around and put together a uh, a training session presentation for that uh, down the road. That's what I'm currently working on, trying to work out those kinks and bugs and build that knowledge level uh, to build, uh, to work with those. Now, probably half the chips that are UBI file systems, I'm successful at recovering them uh, using various techniques and UBI uh, tools that are available out there. Um, but uh, typically GIFs, uh, squash file systems, things like that, uh, can easily be uh, quickly recovered uh, from NAND flash chips using any one of these three methods that we covered uh, today in uh, this presentation. So um, hopefully there's some questions out there. Yeah, I got a couple here. Um, so one question here asks, uh, have you encountered an IoT device that was encrypting the data it was storing in the NAND flash? No, no, I haven't, uh, which is kind of amazing to me. Um, I mean, the only time I've ever seen IoT technology using any kind of encryption, um, if it was running an Android operating system. Uh, and by nature, Android can support um, the uh, data section being completely uh, encrypted. So uh, that's uh, quite common. Uh, I do have um, some other tech that I consider IoT, but it's more enterprise IoT and not necessarily cons the normal consumer grade, uh, which actually is very much encrypted in most of the, not all the file system, but most of the file system that contains user data, similar to the Android file system, uh, is also encrypted. Um, so um, typically, if I see it, it's an Android, it's usually 50-50. If it is a standard um, phone style Android operating system dumped on there, then most always it has encrypted. Um, but yet if it's an older Android style that's put on there, uh, there was no requirement or, or typically that's not always encrypted. So it's a mix and match, but it's pretty rare to see encrypted, uh, at least from a lot of the IoT I've looked at, uh, unless you get into more enterprise, um, enterprise level technology. Anonymous attendee asks, hi, I am new to this, sorry. You already have the binary file. How did you extract it from the hardware device? Uh, in the cases of these, both of them were chip off. Um, so uh, early in the presentation, um, and uh, so you can rewatch this presentation or in the presentation earlier today where we talked about building an IoT uh, lab and we showed uh, a number of devices. Uh, I have a number of chip readers, uh, so I actually use those. Uh, other ways are um, often if the if the chips if the chip that's being used has some kind of debug function, you can put it in debug um, and pull the data off of it. Also, you may be able to check connect in with JTAG or SirWire debug and actually read it off the device. But if those fail, I often rely on just desoldering the chip. Uh, and drop it into a reader and extract the data from there. Um, if I need to put the device back into uh, functionality, then I'll go through either resoldering the chip back on or um, reballing the chip and uh, reflowing it back on in an IR oven, um, which are fairly cumbersome, at least the reballing BGAs, but it's still doable uh, and it's uh, not all that complex. Uh, I did a presentation not uh, last year, but the year before last, uh, at Bo Nuita Hack. Uh, I did it there. I also did it, oh gosh, I did it in Perth, Australia, and I also did it at uh, DerbyCon. And it was, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Basically, it was uh, how to get root access um, 
the hard way. Uh, and it talks about slashing, smashing, cutting the device apart, and rebuilding it to get root access or something to that uh, effect. Um, so you can look at that and it goes through some of the concepts uh, in my learning process on learning how to manually reball uh, BGA chips. Elvis Cousin asks, these are all variants of Linux on a Windows CE device. Might it still use Squash FS or some other Windows thing? Ooh, probably some other Windows thing. Um, I have I have not looked at uh, Windows CE device. Um, I ha have been looking at some Chrome devices um, in those particular and you, you, in the in those particular cases. Um, they have uh, this has an, an SD drive, solid state drive, um, where you're able to get the data off of it and just mount it up on your system. Um, I'm not sure if they have NAND chips. Is it going to be? Um, 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 Linux file system? Probably not. It's probably going to be some variation of Windows, but I have not uh, tore into any Windows or Windows CE type devices to be able to give you a solid answer on that. Let me know if you find out. Any other questions? Nope, I'm all caught up. All right. Well, I think we're, what time we start? Six o'clock. So we're probably right on time. So let me jump over here. Um, let's do a final uh, stop to share. Um, so let's go ahead and um, ask question one more time. Anyone have any questions, uh, any requests for questions or information? Um, if not, uh, you'll probably catch me on uh, Discord either here in a little bit after I've eaten uh, or uh, late tonight or tomorrow. Uh, feel free to hit me up for any questions. Also, oh gosh, yeah, I was promising you that. Hold on, before you all drop off there, let's get this up. So I had promised, slideshow, play from start. I don't know why I did that. Come on over here. So I want to be able to get some of these things captured in the video. So here's a, a NAND sim example that I use, uh, the mod probe commands, the NAND write commands, and the mount to be able to mount this particular GIF file system up. Um, and here is the commands that I use for MTD DRAM uh, example. Um, quick note on some of the commands we use. Uh, there is the link for uh, NAND dump tool. Uh, concept of mod pro make node nan write dd uh, and then uh, here is the reference uh, so that gets captured in here all of this is kind of cool material there's a lot of great work that's been done out there on nan chips uh, like i said i'm constantly reviewing and reading and uh, consuming this uh, material on a regular basis because every time i encounter uh, NAND chip that wants to fight with me, I have to go out and start rethinking, okay, what am I missing? What do I need to learn, expand my knowledge? How do we kind of move forward from here? And there's been a lot of work done out there. And, uh, and of course, we shared uh, much of the information that these people provided uh, in this uh, demonstration today. Uh, also, if you're interested in uh, connecting up with me on uh, Twitter, um, my handles are percent X, so it'd be P E R C E N T underscore X. Um, and feel free to connect with me out there or uh, reach out to me and ask questions out there. Awesome, Daryl. Thank you so much. Oh, man. Sure enough, Sam. Had a blast. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, if there was any, if there are any last questions, we still have a little bit of time. So was there anything else that you saw there, Jonathan? Yeah. Uh, another quick question just popped up. Um, it says, this is some very epic stuff, extracting flash from man chips. I have to ask, did you find anything epic while performing post-exploitation on the extracted firmware? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, any any uh, uh, you know remote shells. No, unfortunately, 
but but again, uh, it's information that uh, that we could feed back to the manufacturers to help improve processes. You know, they get into hard coded stuff. Um, mainly, a lot of this lately was purely an effort to go, hey, what happens when IoT is thrown in the trash? Type thing. You know, is there data? Is is like like the guy with the um, Nest, Nest uh, thermostat? What happens when something dies if you throw it away? Does it contain PII information? So this was kind of a, a lot of it was driven out of that and some paid assessments. Um, and also, you know, I, we tested a lot of devices from, hey, if you go ahead and uh, flush the thing back to factory, does data stay on it? We kind of started checking for things like that. It's all about a privacy uh, risk and issue. Because we've gotten we've gotten really big on the old kind idea that hey we don't want to throw our hard drives away, but in this modern world these chips are our hard drives, uh, and we need to probably start thinking about uh, the potential risk there. Um, so that was kind of the main purpose of a lot of this, and the fact that I had been working on some engagements uh, that involved Dan chips that were problematic. Uh, in those cases, we we're working on things like reconstructing keys to gain access. So a lot of this stuff uh, ties into engagements also where we're looking for data since we're testing an entire ecosystem. That isn't just the hardware, but it may be mobile apps, cloud services, and other devices. What can we get off this chip that could allow us to attack everything else or attack somebody else using the same product uh, because of key reuse and key session keys and password reuse and things like that. So uh, a lot of it's went in that direction. Another question here. Um, this individual asks, does it seem like it is possible to be able to create a module so that a chip reader would automatically be able to, de to detect those out of the OOB areas of the flash memory? Oh, current chip, a uh, number of chip readers will let you identify. Some of them will allow you to extract uh, the chip, the data without the OOB. So, yeah, it's not uncommon. You can often manipulate data uh, from, the, from the chip reader um, and uh, include or not include OOB on some chip readers. Obviously, you get more control as the price of the chip reader goes up. Um, and I don't necessarily have a uh, $2,500 chip reader in here. But I think uh, one of these actually had some OOB settings. Uh, but for some reason, I didn't necessarily trust it um, <laughs> because, because I told it not to include OOB. And then when I visually looked at the data, the OOB data was there. So I kind of lost trust. Uh, I have a tendency to also like to map it out, not let the chip reader make the determination for me. Uh, that this data is structured a certain way, because like I said, it's not uncommon with vendors to futz with it uh, so that it may be incorrect or that the OB shifted or is not used in the same place. And they've just written a new controller uh, to read the data the way they made it. Um, this way it allows me to go, hey, this is correct or isn't correct. Uh, and then I could easily manually remove it or modify uh, code or scripts that are out there to take it out the way I wanted it removed. So that's kind of my take on it. That makes sense. I think that we're at the bottom of the list here for the questions. Okay. Well, I think that kind of concludes it. Uh, if anyone uh, has any questions, catch up with me later. Um, or reach out through me uh, on um, Twitter. And again, I'll be on uh, Discord probably uh, tomorrow and maybe later tonight. So I'll catch everyone later. Um, have a good night.